Chapter Two, Part One, Campaign of Seventeen Seventy Six. At Uncle Joe's, I lived at ease, had cider and good bread and cheese. But while I stayed at Uncle Sam's, I'd naught to eat but faith in clams. During the winter of seventeen seventy five six, by hearing the conversation and disputes of the good old farmer politicians of the times, I collected pretty correct ideas of the contest between this country and the mother country, as it was then called. I thought I was as warm a patriot as the best of them. The war was waged, we had joined issue, and it would not do to put the hand to the plough and look back. I felt more anxious than ever, if possible, to be called a defender of my country. I had not forgot the commencement affair that still stuck in my crop, and it would not do for me to forget it, for that affront was to be my passport to the army. One evening, very early in the spring of this year, I chanced to overhear my grandmam telling my grandsire that I had threatened to engage on board a man of war. I had told her that I would enter on board a privateer then fitting out in our neighborhood. The good old lady thought it a man of war, that and privateer being synonymous terms with her. She said she could not bear the thought of my being on board of a man of war. My grandsire told her that he supposed I was resolved to go into the service in some way or other, and he had rather I would engage in the land service if I must engage in any. This I thought to be a sort of tacit consent for me to go, and I determined to take advantage of it as quick as possible. Soldiers were at this time enlisting for a year's service. I did not like that. It was too long a time for me at the first trial. I wished only to take a priming before I took upon me the whole coat of paint for a soldier. However, the time soon arrived that gratified all my wishes. In the month of June this year, orders came out for enlisting men for six months from the 25th of this month. The troops were styled new levies. They were to go to New York, and notwithstanding I was told that the British army at that place was reinforced by 15,000 men, it made no alteration in my mind. I did not care if there had been 15 times 15,000. I should have gone just as soon as if there had been but 1,500. I never spent a thought about numbers. The Americans were invincible, in my opinion. If anything affected me, it was a stronger desire to see them. Well, as I have said, enlisting orders were out. I used frequently to go to the rendezvous, where I saw many of my young associates enlist, had repeated banterings to engage with them, but still, when it came case in hand, I had my misgivings. If I once undertake, thought I, I must stick to it. There will be no receding. Thoughts like these would, at times, almost overset my resolutions. But maugre all these doleful ideas, I one evening went off with a full determination to enlist at all hazards. When I arrived at the place of rendezvous, I found a number of young men of my acquaintance there. The old bantering began. Come, if you will enlist, I will, says one. You have long been talking about it, says another. Come, now is the time. Thinks I to myself, I will not be laughed into it or out of it at any rate. I will act my own pleasure after all. But what did I come here for to-night? Why, to enlist. Then enlist I will. So seating myself at the table, enlisting orders were immediately presented to me. I took up the pen, loaded it with the fatal charge, made several mimic imitations of writing my name, but took especial care not to touch the paper with the pen until an unlucky wit, who was leaning over my shoulder, gave my hand a stroke, which caused the pen to make a woeful scratch on the paper. Oh, he has enlisted said he. He has made his mark. He is fast enough now. Well, thought I, I may as well go through with the business now as not. So I wrote my name fairly upon the indentures. And now I was a soldier, in name at least, if not in practice. But I had now to go home, after performing this, my heroic action. How shall I be received there? But the report of my adventure had reached there before I did. In the morning, when I first saw my grandparents, I felt considerably of the sheepish order. The old gentleman first accosted me with, Well, you are going to soldiering then, are you? I had nothing to answer. I would much rather he had not asked me the question. I saw that the circumstance hurt him and the old lady too, but it was too late now to repent. The old gentleman proceeded, I suppose you must be fitted out for the expedition, since it is so. Accordingly, 
They did fit me out in order, with arms and accoutrements, clothing and cake, and cheese in plenty, not forgetting to put my pocket Bible into my knapsack. Good old people. They wished me well, soul and body. I sincerely thanked them for their kindness and love to me. From the time I first came to live with them, to the last parting hour, I hope, nay, I believe, that their spirits now rest in the realms of bliss. May it be my happy lot to meet them there. I was now what I had long wished to be, a soldier. I had obtained my heart's desire. It was now my business to prove myself equal to my profession. Well, to be short, I went, with several others of the company, on board a sloop bound to New York, had a pleasant though protracted passage, passed through the strait called Hellgate, where all who had not before passed it had to pay a treat. I had been through it before. Arrived at New York, marched up into the city, and joined the rest of the regiment that were already there. And now I had left my good old grandsire's house, as a constant resident, forever, and had to commence exercising my function. I was called out every morning at Reveille beating, which was at daybreak, to go to our regimental parade in Broad Street, and there practice the manual exercise, which was the most that was known in our new levies, if they knew even that. I was brought to an allowance of provisions, which, while we lay in New York, was not bad. If there was any deficiency, it could in some measure be supplied by procuring some kind of sauce. But I was a stranger to such living. I began soon to miss Grandsire's table and cellar. However, I reconciled myself to my condition as well as I could. It was my own seeking. I had had no compulsion. Soon after my arrival at New York, a forty-gun ship, the Phoenix, and a small frigate, the Rose, I think, came down the North or Hudson River. They had been some time in the river, and passed the city in fine style, amidst a cannonade from all our fortifications, in and near the city. I went into what was then called the Grand Battery, where I had a complete view of the whole affair. Here I first heard the muttering of cannon shot, but they did not disturb my feelings so much as I apprehended they would before I had heard them. I rather thought the sound was musical, or at least grand. I heard enough of them afterwards to form what ideas I pleased of them, whether musical, grand, or doleful, and perhaps I have formed each of those ideas upon different occasions. I would here, once for all, remark, that as I write altogether from memory, the reader must not expect to have an exact account of dates. I mean of days and weeks. As to years and months, I shall not be wide from the mark. As I have entitled my book, The Adventures, etc., of a Revolutionary Soldier, it is possible the reader may expect to have a minute detail of all my adventures. I have not promised any such thing. It was what belonged to me, and what transpired in my line of duty that I proposed to narrate. But when some mischievous incident occurred, I am willing to give a short detail of it. I never wished to do anyone an injury through malice in my life, nor did I ever do anyone an intentional injury while I was in the army, unless it was when sheer necessity drove me to it. And my conscience bears me witness that innumerable times I have suffered rather than take from anyone what belonged of right to them, even to satisfy the cravings of nature. But I cannot say so much in favor of my levity. That would often get the upper hand of me, do what I would. And sometimes it would run riot with me. But still I did not mean to do harm. Only recreation, reader, recreation. I wanted often to recreate myself, to keep the blood from stagnating. The soldiers at New York had an idea that the enemy, when they took possession of the town, would make a general seizure of all property that could be of use to them as military or commissary stores. Hence they imagined that it was no injury to supply themselves when they thought they could do so with impunity, which was the case of my having any hand in the transaction I am going to relate. Whether the reader will attribute it to levity, necessity, or roguery, I am not able to say. Perhaps to one or the other of them, it may be to all. I was stationed in Stone Street near the southwest angle of the city. Directly opposite to my quarters was a wine cellar. There were in the cellar at this time several pipes of Madeira wine. By some means the soldiers had smelt it out. Some of them had, at midday, taken the iron grating from a window in the back yard, and one had entered the cellar, and by means of a powder horn divested of its bottom 
had supplied himself with wine and was helping his comrades through the window with a delicious draught, when the owner of the wine, having discovered what they were about, very wisely as it seemed, came into the street and opened an outer door to the cellar in open view of every passenger. The soldiers quickly filled the cellar, when he, to save his property, proposed to sell it at what he called a cheap rate, I think a dollar a gallon. In one corner of the cellar lay a large pile of oil flasks, holding from half a gallon to a gallon each. They were empty and not very savory neither, as they had lain there till the oil which adhered to the sides and bottoms had become quite rancid. While the owner was drawing for his purchasers on one side of the cellar, behind him on the other side another set of purchasers were drawing for themselves, filling those flasks. As it appeared to have a brisk sale, especially in the latter case, I concluded I would take a flask amongst the rest, which I accordingly did, and conveyed it in safety to my room, and went back into the street to see the end. The owner of the wine soon found out what was going forward on his premises, and began remonstrating. But he preached to the wind, finding that he could effect nothing with them. He went to General Putnam's quarters, which was not more than three or four rods off. The general immediately repaired in person to the field of action. The soldiers getting wind of his approach hurried out into the street, when he, mounting himself upon the doorsteps of my quarters, began haranguing the multitude, threatening to hang every mother's son of them. Whether he was to be the hangman or not he did not say, but I took every word he said for gospel, and expected nothing else but to be hanged before the morrow night. I sincerely wished him hanged and out of the way, for fixing himself upon the steps of our door, but he soon ended his discourse, and came down from his rostrum, and the soldiers dispersed, no doubt much edified. I got home as soon as the general had left the coast clear, took a draught of the wine, and then flung the flask and the remainder of the wine out of my window, from the third story, into the water cistern in the back yard, where it remains to this day for aught I know. However, I might have kept it if I had not been in too much haste to free myself from being hanged by General Putnam, or by his order. I never heard of anything further about the wine or being hanged about it. He doubtless forgot it. I remained in New York two or three months, in which time several things occurred, but so strifling that I shall not mention them. When some time in the latter part of the month of August I was ordered upon a fatigue party, we had scarcely reached the grand parade when I saw our sergeant major directing his course up Broadway towards us in rather an unusual step for him. He soon arrived and informed us, and then the commanding officer of the party, that he had orders to take off all belonging to our regiment and march us to our quarters, as the regiment was ordered to Long Island, the British having landed in force there. Although this was not unexpected to me, yet it gave me a rather disagreeable feeling as I was pretty well assured I should have to snuff a little gunpowder. However, I kept my cogitations to myself, went to my quarters, packed up my clothes, and got myself in readiness for the expedition as soon as possible. I then went to the top of the house, where I had a full view of that part of the island. I distinctly saw the smoke of the field artillery, but the distance and the unfavorableness of the wind prevented my hearing their report, at least but faintly. The horrors of battle then presented themselves to my mind in all their hideousness. I must come to it now, thought I. Well, I will endeavor to do my duty as well as I am able, and leave the event with providence. We were soon ordered to our regimental parade, from which, as soon as the regiment was formed, we were marched off for the ferry. At the lower end of the street were placed several casks of sea bread, made, I believe, of cannel and peas meal nearly hard enough for musket flints. The casks were unheaded, and each man was allowed to take as many as he could as he marched by. As my good luck would have it, there was a momentary halt made. I improved the opportunity thus offered me, as every good soldier should upon all important occasions, to get as many of the biscuit as I possibly could. No one said anything to me, and I filled my bosom and took as many as I could hold in my hand, a dozen or more in all, and when we arrived at the ferry stairs I stowed them away in my knapsack. We quickly embarked on board the boats. As each boat started, three cheers were given by those on board, which was returned by the numerous spectators who thronged the wharfs. They all wished us good luck, apparently, although it was with most of them perhaps nothing more than ceremony. We soon landed at Brooklyn, upon the island, 
marched up the ascent from the ferry to the plain. We now began to meet the wounded men, another sight I was unacquainted with, some with broken arms, some with broken legs, and some with broken heads. The sight of these a little daunted me. It made me think of home, but the sight and thought vanished together. We marched a short distance when we halted to refresh ourselves. Whether we had any other victuals besides the hard bread I do not remember, but I remember my gnawing at them. They were hard enough to break the teeth of a rat. One of the soldiers, complaining of thirst to his officer, "'Look at that man,' said he, pointing to me. "'He is not thirsty. I will warrant it.' I felt a little elevated to be styled a man. While resting here, which was not more than twenty minutes or half an hour, the Americans and British were warmly engaged within sight of us. What were the feelings of most or all the young soldiers at this time, I know not, but I know what were mine. But let mine or theirs be what they might, I saw a lieutenant who appeared to have feelings not very enviable. Whether he was actuated by fear, or the canteen I cannot determine now. I thought it fear at the time, for he ran round among the men of his company, snivelling and blubbering, praying each one if he had aught against him, and if he had injured any one that they would forgive him, declaring at the same time that he, from his heart, forgave them if they had offended him, and I gave him full credit for his assertion. For had he been at the gallows with a halter about his neck, he could not have shown more fear or penitence. A fine soldier you are, I thought, a fine officer, an exemplary man for young soldiers. I would have then suffered anything short of death rather than have made such an exhibition of myself. But as the poet says, Fear does things so like a witch, tis hard to distinguish which is which. The officers of the new levies wore cockades of different colors to distinguish them from the standing forces, as they were called. The field officers wore red, the captains white, and the subaltern officers green. While we were resting here, our lieutenant colonel and major, our colonel not being with us, took their cockades from their hats. Being asked the reason, the lieutenant colonel replied that he was willing to risk his life in the cause of his country, but unwilling to stand a particular mark for the enemy to fire at. He was a fine officer and a brave soldier. We were soon called upon to fall in and proceed. We had not gone far, about half a mile, when I heard one in the rear ask another where his musket was. I looked round and saw one of the soldiers stemming off without his gun, having left it where we last halted. He was inspecting his side as if undetermined whether he had it or not. He then fell out of the ranks to go in search of it. One of the company, who had brought it on, wishing to see how far he would go before he missed it, gave it to him. The reader will naturally enough conclude that he was a brave soldier. Well, he was a brave fellow for all this accident, and received two severe wounds, by musket balls, while fearlessly fighting for his country at the Battle of White Plains. So true is the proverb, a singed cat may make a good mouser. Stranger things may happen. We overtook a small party of the artillery here, dragging a heavy twelve-pounder upon a field carriage, sinking halfway to the knaves in the sandy soil. They pled hard for some of us to assist them to get on their piece. Our officers, however, paid no attention to their entreaties, but pressed forward towards a creek, where a large party of Americans and British were engaged. By the time we arrived the enemy had driven our men into the creek, or rather mill-pond, the tide being up, where such as could swim got across. Those that could not swim, and could not procure anything to buoy them up, sunk. The British, having several field pieces stationed by a brick house, were pouring the canister and grape upon the Americans like a shower of hail. They would doubtless have done them much more damage than they did, but for the twelve-pounder mentioned above, the men having gotten it within sufficient distance to reach them, and opening a fire upon them, soon obliged them to shift their quarters. There was in this action a regiment of Maryland troopers, volunteers, all young gentlemen. When they came out of the water and mud to us, looking like water rats, it was a truly pitiful sight. Many of them were killed in the pond, and more were drowned. Some of us went into the water after the fall of the tide, and took out a number of corpses, and a great many arms that were sunk in the pond and creek. Our regiment lay on the ground we then occupied the following night. The next day in the afternoon we had a considerable tight scratch with about an equal number of the British, which began rather unexpectedly, and a little whimsically. A few of our men, I mean of our regiment, went over the creek upon business that usually employed us, that is, in search of something to eat. 
There was a field of Indian corn at a short distance from the creek. With several cocks of hay about halfway from the creek to the cornfield, the men purposed to get some of the corn, or anything else that was eatable. When they got up with haycocks, they were fired upon by about an equal number of the British from the cornfield. Our people took to the hay, and the others to the fence, where they exchanged a number of shots at each other, neither side inclining to give back. A number, say forty or fifty more of our men, went over and drove the British from the fence. They were by this time reinforced in their turn, and drove us back. The two parties kept thus alternately reinforcing until we had the most of our regiment in the action. After the officers came to command, the English were soon routed from the place, but we dare not follow them for fear of falling into some snare, as the whole British army was in the vicinity of us. I do not recollect that we had any one killed outright, but we had several severely wounded, and some, I believe, mortally. Our regiment was alone, no other troops being near where we were lying. We were upon a rising ground covered with a young growth of trees. We felled offensive trees around us to prevent the approach of the enemy's horse. We lay there a day longer. In the latter part of the afternoon there fell a very heavy shower of rain which wet us all to the skin, and much damaged our ammunition. About sunset, when the shower had passed over, we were ordered to parade and discharge our pieces. We attempted to fire by platoons for improvement, but we made blundering work of it. It was more like a running fire than firing by divisions. However, we got our muskets as empty as our stomachs, and with half the trouble. Nor was it half the trouble to have reloaded them, for we had wherewithal to do that, but not so with our stomachs. Just at dusk, I, with one or two others of our company, went off to a barn about half a mile distant, with intent to get some straw to lodge upon, the ground and leaves being drenched in water, and we as wet as they. It was quite dark in the barn, and while I was fumbling about the floor, some one called to me from the top of the mow, inquiring where I was from. I told him. He asked me if we had not had an engagement there, having heard us discharging our guns. I told him we had, and a severe one too. He asked if many were killed. I told him that I saw none killed, nor any very badly wounded. I then heard several others, as it appeared, speaking on the mow. Poor fellows! They had better have been at their post than skulking in a barn on account of a little wet, for I have not the least doubt but that the British had possession of their mortal parts before the noon of the next day. I could not find any straw, but I found some wheat in the sheaf, standing by the side of the floor. I took a sheaf or two and returned as fast as I could to the regiment. When I arrived, the men were all paraded to march off the ground. I left my wheat, seized my musket, and fell into the ranks. We were strictly enjoined not to speak or even cough while on the march. All orders were given from officer to officer and communicated to the men in whispers. What such secrecy could mean we could not divine. We marched off in the same way that we had come on to the island, forming various conjectures among ourselves as to our destination. Some were of the opinion that we were to endeavor to get on the flank or in the rear of the enemy. Others, that we were going up to the East River to attack them in that quarter, but none, it seems, knew the right of the matter. We marched on, however, until we arrived at the ferry, where we immediately embarked on board the bateau and conveyed safely to New York, where we were landed about three o'clock in the morning, nothing against our inclinations. The next day the British showed themselves to be in possession of our works upon the island, by firing upon some of our boats, passing to and from Governor's Island. Our regiment was employed, during this day, in throwing up a sort of breastwork, at their alarm post upon the wharfs, facing the enemy, composed of spars and logs, and filling the space between with the materials of which the wharves were composed, old broken junk bottles, flint stones, etc., which, had a cannon-ball passed through, would have chanced to kill five men where the ball would won. But the enemy did not see fit to molest us. We stayed several days longer in the city, when one morning we discovered that a small frigate had advanced up and was lying above Governor's Island, close under the Long Island shore. Several other ships had come up and were lying just below the town. They seemed to portend evil. In the evening, just at dark, our regiment was ordered to march to Turtle Bay, a place about four miles distant, on the East River, where were a large warehouse or two, called then the King's Stores, 
built for the storing of marine stores belonging to the government, before the war. There was at this time about 2,500 barrels of flour in those storehouses, and it was conjectured that the design of the forementioned frigate, or rather the officers and crew of her, was to seize on this flour. We were, therefore, ordered to secure it, before the British should have an opportunity to lay their unhallowed hands upon it. We arrived at the place about midnight, and by sunrise, or a little after, had secured the whole of it, by rolling it up a steep bank and piling it behind a ledge of rocks. While we were employed in doing this, some other troops were constructing a small battery on a point of land opposite the frigate, she having arrived during the night and anchored just below us, not being able to get quite up by the failure of the wind, and as soon as we had finished our work at the flower, the battery opened upon her with two long twelve-pounders, which so gulled her ribs that her situation began to grow rather uneasy to her. She never returned a shot at the battery, but got under way as quick as possible and ran by us, there being then a little wind. We all stood gazing at her as she passed, when she sent us a nine-pound shot, perhaps the best she had to send us, which passed through amongst us without injuring anyone. She ran a little way up the river and came to anchor again. We continued here some days to guard the flower. We were forbidden by our officers to use any of it, except our daily allowance. We used, however, to purloin some of it to eat and exchange with the inhabitants for milk, sauce, and such small matters as we could get for it of them. While we lay here I saw a piece of American workmanship that was, as I thought, rather remarkable. Going one evening upon a piquet guard in a subaltern officer's command, a mile or two farther up the river, we had to march through the enclosures close upon the bank of the river. There was a small party of British upon an island in the river, known generally by a queer name, given it upon as queer an occasion, which I shall not stop now to unfold. These British soldiers seemed to be very busy in chasing some scattering sheep that happened to be so unlucky as to fall in their way. One of the soldiers, however, thinking perhaps he could do more mischief by killing some of us, had posted himself on a point of rocks at the southern extremity of the island and kept firing at us as we were passed along the bank. Several of his shots passed between our files, but we took little notice of him, thinking he was so far off that he could do us but little hurt, and that we could do him none at all, until one of the guard asked the officer if he might discharge his piece at him. As it was charged and would not hinder us long, the officer gave his consent. He rested his old six-foot barrel across the fence and sent an express to him. The man dropped, but as we then thought it was only to amuse us, we took no further notice of it, but passed on. In the morning, upon our return, we saw the brick-colored coat still lying in the same position we had left it in the evening before. It was a long distance to hit a single man with a musket. It was certainly over half a mile. One evening, while lying here, we heard a heavy cannonade at the city, and before dark saw four of the enemy's ships that had passed the town and were coming up the East River. They anchored just below us. These ships were the Phoenix, of forty-four guns, the Roebuck, of forty-four, the Rose, of thirty-two, and another, the name of which I have forgotten. Half of our regiment was sent off under the command of our major, to man something that were called lines, although they were nothing more than a ditch dug along the bank of the river, with the dirt thrown out towards the water. They stayed in these lines during the night, and returned to the camp in the morning unmolested. The other half of the regiment went the next night, under the command of the lieutenant colonel, upon the like errand. We arrived at the lines about dark, and were ordered to leave our packs in a copse wood, under a guard, and go into the lines without them. What was the cause of this piece of wise policy I never knew, but I knew the effects of it, which was, that I never saw my knapsack from that day to this. Nor did any of the rest of our party, unless they came across them by accident in our retreat. We manned the lines, and lay quite as unmolested during the whole night, as Samson did the half of his day in the city of Gaza, upon about as foolish a business, though there was some difference in our getting away. We did not go off in so much triumph quite as he did. We had a chain of sentinels quite up the river, for four or five miles in length. At an interval of every half hour they passed the watchword to each other, All is well. I heard the British on board their ship answering, We will alter your tune before tomorrow night, and they were as good as their word for once. 
It was quite a dark night, and at daybreak the first thing that saluted our eyes was all the four ships at anchor, with springs upon their cables, and within musket shot of us. The Phoenix lying a little quartering, and her stern towards me, I could read her name as distinctly as though I had been directly under her stern. What is the meaning of all this, thought I? What is coming forward now? They appeared to be very busy on shipboard, but we lay still and showed our good breeding by not interfering with them, as they were strangers, and we knew not, but they were bashful withal. As soon as it was fairly light, we saw their boats coming out of a creek or cove, on the long island side of the water, filled with British soldiers. When they came to the edge of the tide, they formed their boats in line. They continued to augment their forces from the island until they appeared like a large clover field in full bloom. And now was coming on the famous Kipps Bay affair, which has been criticized so much by the historians of the Revolution. I was there and will give a true statement of all that I saw during that day. It was on a Sabbath morning, the day in which the British were always employed about their deviltry, if possible, because they said they had the prayers of the church on that day. We lay very quiet in our ditch, waiting their motions, till the sun was an hour or two high. We heard a cannonade at the city, but our attention was drawn toward our own guests. But they, being a little dilatory in their operations, I stepped into an old warehouse which stood close by me, with the door open, inviting me in, and sat down upon a stool. The floor was strewed with papers which had in some former period been used in the concerns of the house, but were then lying in woeful confusion. I was very demurely perusing these papers, when all of a sudden there came such a peal of thunder from the British shipping that I thought my head would go with the sound. I made a frog's leap for the ditch, and lay as still as I possibly could, and began to consider which part of my carcass was to go first. The British played their parts well. Indeed, they had nothing to hinder them. We kept the lines till they were almost leveled upon us, when our officers, seeing we could make no resistance, and no orders coming from any superior officer, and that we must soon be entirely exposed to the rake of their guns, gave the order to leave the lines. In retreating we had to cross a level clear spot of ground, forty or fifty yards wide, exposed to the whole of the enemy's fire, and they gave it to us in prime order. The grape-shot and language flew merrily, which served to quicken our motions. When I had gotten a little out of the reach of their combustibles, I found myself in company with one who was a neighbor of mine when at home, and one other man belonging to our regiment, where the rest of them were I knew not. We went into a house by the highway, in which were two women and some small children, all crying most bitterly. We asked the women if they had any spirits in the house. They placed a case bottle of rum upon the table and bid us help ourselves. We each of us drank a glass, and bidding them good-bye, betook ourselves to the highway again. We had not gone far before we saw a party of men, apparently hurrying on in the same direction with ourselves. We endeavored hard to overtake them, but on approaching them we found that they were not of our way of thinking. They were Hessians. We immediately altered our course and took the main road leading to King's Bridge. We had not long been on this road before we saw another party just ahead of us, whom we knew to be Americans. Just as we overtook these, they were fired upon by a party of British from a cornfield, and all was immediately in confusion again. I believe the enemy's party was small, but our people were all militia and the demons of fear and disorder seemed to take full possession of all and everything on that day. When I came to the spot where the militia were fired upon, the ground was literally covered with arms, knapsacks, staves, coats, hats, and old oil flasks. Perhaps some of those from the Madeira wine cellar in New York. All I picked up of the plunder was a block tin syringe, which afterwards helped to procure me a Thanksgiving dinner. Myself and the man whom I mentioned as belonging to our company were all who were in company at this time, the other man having gone on with those who were fired upon. They did not tarry to let the grass grow much under their feet. We had to advance slowly, for my comrade, having been some time unwell, was now so overcome by heat, hunger, and fatigue that he became suddenly and violently sick. I took his musket and endeavored to encourage him on. He was, as I before observed, a nigh neighbor of mine when at home, and I was loath to leave him behind, although I was anxious to find the main part of the regiment, if possible, before night, for I thought 
that that part of it which was not in the lines was in a body somewhere. We soon came in sight of a large party of Americans ahead of us, who appeared to have come into this road by some other route. We were within sight of them when they were fired upon by another party of the enemy. They returned but a very few shots, and then scampered off as fast as their legs could carry them. When we came to the ground they had occupied, the same display of lumber presented itself as at the other place. We here found a wounded man and some of his comrades endeavoring to get him off. I stopped to assist them in constructing a sort of litter to lay him upon, when my sick companion, growing impatient, moved on, and as soon as we had placed the wounded man upon the litter I followed him. While I was here, one or two of our regiment came up, and we went on together. We had proceeded but a short distance, however, before we found our retreat cut off by a party of the enemy stretched across the island. I immediately quitted the road and went into the fields, where there happened to be a small spot of boggy land, covered with low bushes and weeds. Into these I ran, and squatting down, concealed myself from their sight. Several of the British came so near to me that I could see the buttons on their clothes. They, however, soon withdrew and left the coast clear for me again. I then came out of my covert and went on, but what had become of my sick comrade or the rest of my companions I knew not. I still kept the sick man's musket. I was unwilling to leave it, for it was his own property and I knew he valued it highly, and I had a great esteem for him. I had, indeed, enough to do to take care of my own concerns. It was exceeding hot weather, and I was faint having slept but very little the preceding night, nor had I eaten a mouthful of victuals for more than twenty-four hours. I waddled on as well and as fast as I could, and soon came up with a number of men at a small brook, where they had stopped to drink and rest themselves a few moments. Just as I arrived, a man had lain down to drink at the brook, and as he did not rise very soon, one of the company observed that he would kill himself with drinking, upon which another, touching him without his appearing to notice it, said he had already killed himself, which was the case. Leaving them, I went on again and directly came to a foul piece in the road, where the soldiers had taken down the fence to pass into the fields. I passed across the corner of one field and threw a gap in a cross fence into another. Here I found a number of men resting upon the trees and bushes in the fences. Almost the first I saw, after passing the gap in the fence, was my sick friend. I was exceeding glad to find him, for I had but little hope of ever seeing him again. He was sitting near the fence with his head between his knees. I tapped him upon the shoulder, and asked him to get up and go on with me. No, said he, at the same time regarding me with a most pitiful look. I must die here. I endeavored to argue the case with him, but all to no purpose. He insisted upon dying there. I told him he should not die there nor anywhere else that day, if I could help it, and at length, with more persuasion and some force, I succeeded in getting him upon his feet again and to moving on. There happened just at this instant a considerable shower of rain, which wet us all to the skin, being very thinly clad. We, however, continued to move on, although but slowly. After proceeding about half a mile, we came to a place where our people had begun to make a stand. A number, say two or three hundred, had collected here, having been stopped by the artillery officers. They had two or three field pieces fixed and fitted for action, in case the British came on, which was momentarily expected. I and my comrades, for I had found another of our company when I found my sick man, were stopped here, a sentinel being placed in the road to prevent our going any further. I felt very much chagrined to be thus hindered from proceeding, as I felt confident that our regiment, or some considerable part of it, was not far ahead, unless they had been more unlucky than I had. I remonstrated with the officer who detained us. I told him that our regiment was just ahead. He asked me how I knew that. I could not tell him, but I told him I had a sick man with me who was wet and would die if exposed all night to the damp cold air, hoping by this to move his compassion but it would not do. He was inexorable. I shall not soon forget the answer he gave me when I made the last mentioned observation respecting the sick man. Well, said he, if he dies, the country will be rid of one who can do it no good. Pretty fellow, thought I, a very compassionate gentleman. When a man has got his bane in his country's cause, let him die like an old horse or dog, because he can do no more. 
The only wish I would wish such men would be to let them have exactly the same treatment which they would give to others. I saw but little chance of escaping from this very humane gentleman by fair means, so I told my two comrades to stick by me and keep together, and we would get from them by some means or other during the evening. It was now almost sundown and the air quite chilly after the shower, and we were as wet as water could make us. I was really afraid my sick man would die in earnest. I had not stayed there long, after this entertaining dialogue with my obliging friend, the officer, waiting for an opportunity to escape, before one offered. There came to the sentinel, I suppose, an old acquaintance of his, with a canteen containing some sort of spirits. After drinking himself, he gave it to the sentinel, who took a large pull upon it. They then fell into conversation together, but soon taking a hare from the same hound, it put them into quite a talkative mood. I kept my eyes upon them, and when I thought I saw a chance of getting from them, I gave my companions a wink, and we passed by the sentinel without his noticing us at all. A walk of a very few rods concealed us from his view, by a turn in the road and some bushes, and thus we escaped from prison. For we thought we were hardly dealt by, to be confined by those whom we took to be our friends, after having labored so hard to escape being made prisoners by the common enemy. We went on a little distance, when we overtook another man belonging to our company. He had just been refreshing himself with some bread and dry salt fish, and was putting the fragments into his knapsack. I longed for a bite, but I felt too bashful to ask him, and he was too thoughtless or stingy to offer it. We still proceeded, but had not gone far, when we came up with the regiment, resting themselves on the cold ground after the fatigue of the day. Our company all appeared to rejoice to see us, thinking we were killed or prisoners. I was sincerely glad to see them, for I was once more among friends, or at least acquaintances. Several of the regiment were missing, among whom was our major. He was a fine man, and his loss was much regretted by the men of the regiment. We were the last who came up. All the others who were missing were either killed or taken prisoners. And here ends the Kipps Bay affair, which caused at the time, and has since caused, much ink shed. Antidotes, jests, imprecations, and sarcasms have been multiplied, and even the grave writers of the Revolution have said and written more about it than it deserved. I could make some observations, but it is beyond my province. End of chapter 2, part 1